The Bible isn't just an old book. It's packed with prophecies that have already come true and others that have yet to happen. You might be wondering how we can be sure that the rest of the prophecies will happen as predicted. Well, we as Christians believe because the Bible tells us so. 1 Peter 1, 24-25 says, For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers in the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Jesus hammered this point home too, in Matthew 24, 35, saying, Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. That's not just a confirmation. It's a rock-solid guarantee that God's word holds true, and the prophecies within will all play out no matter how long it takes. Now that we're clear that every prophecy in the Bible will come true, let's talk about something intense. What the Antichrist will do in the end times. Today, I'm going to reveal some things that the Antichrist has prophesied to do, and why as believers we need to be alert so that we're not caught off guard when these events begin. So, let's get into it. The Bible tells us about a future world leader called the Antichrist, who will have immense power and demand to be worshipped. This period will be the darkest in human history, marked by extreme suffering and tribulation. People will wish they were never born. The Antichrist will be a terrifying ruler, introducing the infamous Mark of the Beast, also known as 666. Revelation 13, 16-17 tells us, It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. According to the Bible, during this time, everyone will be forced to receive this mark on their hand or forehead to participate in society. This mark will also be necessary to buy and sell anything. But here's the crucial part. Accepting the mark signifies a clear rejection of God's offer of salvation and a pledge of loyalty to the Antichrist's government. It's a serious decision with eternal consequences. The Bible doesn't give us specific details about the form or system of the mark of the beast, but it does prophesy its coming. With today's technological advancements like facial recognition, implants, and digital tattoos, it's becoming easier to imagine how the Mark of the Beast, or 666, could be implemented. Could these technologies play a role fulfilling the prophecy? It's a possibility, especially considering their growing acceptance in various parts of the world. But will everyone actually receive it? That's a big question. In this video, we'll explore the possibilities of how the Mark of the Beast might be introduced smoothly drawing insights from scripture and observing historical events. Let's delve into it. Number 1. Oppression and Tyranny The Antichrist's rule will be marked by severe oppression and tyranny, initially targeting believers and then the Jewish population. He'll employ brutal tactics and instill fear using a powerful network of intelligence and military forces. Notably, all world leaders will support his regime, granting him extensive control to monitor every individual's activities. Refusing to worship the Antichrist or accept the mark of the beast will be seen as treason against his government and be met with harsh consequences. The Bible warns of death threats for those who resist. Surveillance will be widespread, ensuring strict control and punishment for dissenters. Those who stand against the Antichrist may face imprisonment, martyrdom, or execution. It'll be a terrifying era of global dictatorship. But here's the thing, we don't have to give in to fear. As the great Apostle Paul said in Romans 8, 38-39, Nothing can separate us from God's love in Christ Jesus, not even death, life, angels, demons, the present, the future, powers, heights, depths, or anything else in all creation. We must remain steadfast in truth and resist oppression and tyranny. Now let's explore another possibility of how the mark of the beast could be enforced worldwide. Number 2. Seduction and Deception 
The Bible warns us that the Antichrist's rule will be marked by profound deception. It won't just be about brute force. He'll be a master manipulator, weaving a web of deceit so cunning it'll even fool some good people. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9-10 tells us, The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie, in all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. The Antichrist will mimic Christ to deceive people. Picture this, the Antichrist performing miracles that mirror Jesus' own. He'll perform miracles reminiscent of those that Jesus performed during His time on earth. But these are cheap tricks, illusions meant to dazzle and mislead. He'll be a con artist using flashy gimmicks to gain your trust before pulling the rug out from under you. These signs and wonders will lead people astray. But why will people fall for it? The Bible says it's because they don't choose truth and love. They're vulnerable to deception because they haven't built a foundation on the genuine connection with God. Here's the key. Don't be one of those people. Seek truth, cling to faith, and remember, real miracles come from genuine love, not manipulative theatrics. Furthermore, the Antichrist will masquerade as the Messiah, using his deceitful wonders to claim he's brought the peace and prosperity the world craves. Imagine a master illusionist promising the world peace, prosperity, and even survival itself in return for accepting his mark. He would suggest that taking the mark will enhance people's lives. These lies will sway many to accept the mark of the beast as the only means of survival. Those who refuse will face persecution, being denied basic necessities like food, water, and shelter. Some will even be betrayed by their own family members in a bid to survive. Jesus warned us of this, saying that family members will betray each other. This betrayal will be fueled by the spirit of deception rampant during the Antichrist's reign. This leads us to the final possibility of how the mark of the beast will be enforced. Number 3. Global Disasters in Revelation 6, we see a glimpse of the wars, famine, and diseases that will ravage the world, pushing humanity to seek urgent solutions. Imagine the despair and the desperation. Now, picture the Antichrist stepping in, promising solutions, offering food, water, medicine, the very things people crave most. The Antichrist only offers aid to those who pledge loyalty by accepting the mark of the beast, the widespread disasters will coerce many into accepting the mark. Imagine the dilemma. Accept the mark or watch your family suffer. This is a tactic the Antichrist will use to ensure compliance, instilling fear of starvation or medical neglect. Moreover, the Antichrist may establish a global currency and economy, making it impossible to buy or sell without the mark. Many will be deceived into believing it offers protection from the harsh realities they face. But in truth, they will be enslaved. With his control over the economy, those without the mark will be unable to access money, pay bills, or obtain necessary services. Despite all these challenges, Jesus admonishes us to stand firm in our faith until the end. We must not be swayed by the Antichrist's deceptions, but remain focused on the return of the Lord. Even though the Antichrist's rule will be terrible, it won't last long. In short, the Antichrist is a false messiah aiming for world domination to destroy Israel and all followers of Jesus Christ. We must keep our focus on the Lord's return while seeking Him wholeheartedly and looking forward to that day. The Bible also admonishes us to live in a holy way, obeying God's word, loving others as Christ loved us, in avoiding any involvement with hidden activities of darkness. Just as the Bible says in Ephesians 5.11, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Friends, it's important to know that the same spirit empowering the Antichrist is already at work in the world, spreading confusion and deception by leading people away from the Lord Jesus Christ, His sacrificial death on the cross, and His resurrection from the dead. 1 John 4, 1-3 says, 
Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. Knowing what the Antichrist will do, we should also understand that the spirit of the Antichrist is already at work, deceiving people through lust and temptation. This spirit is making a serious effort to lead many people away from the truth about God and salvation. However, Jesus offers us hope and life that can overcome Satan's greatest deceptions. He is the only way, the truth, and the life. As Christians, we must stand firm and not give in to the devil's tactics. We should keep our focus on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. As Hebrews 12, 1-2 tells us, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily tangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. By fixing our eyes on Jesus, we can avoid being deceived, because he always guides us through the Holy Spirit in every aspect of our lives. Now, let's pray a simple prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the wisdom and insight you've given us to recognize the enemy's tactics. Help us to remain steadfast in our faith, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus amidst the challenges and deceptions of this world. Guide us by your holy hand and empower us to resist the spirit of the Antichrist. May we continue to walk in truth and love, shining your light in the darkness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Imagine if I told you that many of us aren't seeing what's already happening regarding the government of the Antichrist and the beast. It's sad that many people don't realize these things are unfolding right in front of us. But what's even sadder is that many Christians aren't aware of these things either. In this video, I want to show you what's already happening to bring about the government of the Antichrist. I'm truly glad you're watching this video right now. Please, open your heart and let God speak to you. Now, let's dive into the topic and explore it further. Daniel prophesied about this in Daniel 8, 23-25. In the latter part of their reign, when rebels have become completely wicked, a fierce-looking king, a master of intrigue, will arise. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy those who are mighty, the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper, and he will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed, not by human power. The prophecy has two main parts. The first is already happening, and the second is about the future. The historical part is directly about a man called Antiochus Epiphanes. He was an ancient Greek king who was very cruel and well known for persecuting the Jews while he was in power. He caused a lot of suffering for the Jewish people and made their lives extremely difficult. Antiochus even went as far as to invade the temple in Jerusalem and take all the valuable things from it. He then set up an altar for Zeus and performed a sacrilegious act by sacrificing a pig on it. When the Jews tried to resist his terrible actions, he responded with even more cruelty by killing many Jews and selling others into slavery. Antiochus even forced the Jews to worship gods that were unfamiliar to them. Even though Antiochus did terrible things, Daniel predicted that he would be defeated, but not by human strength. Just as Daniel said, Antiochus met a disastrous end. Daniel's prophecy also foretells what the Antichrist will do in the end times. Similar to Antiochus, the Antichrist will rise to power and become very influential. He'll deceive many people and force everyone in the world to worship him. The Antichrist will have a huge impact on politics, the military, 
religion, and the economy. His influence will be so strong that it'll seem impossible to live without him. How will this happen? The Bible already gives us a hint in Revelation 13, 16 to 18. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. One tactic the Antichrist will use is the use of force. The Bible is very clear about this. In our world today, there are already serious plans to bring about the rule of the Antichrist, known as the New World Order. These plans are carefully designed to make sure that the Antichrist government will be successful. This is to prepare people mentally, economically, and politically for the New World Order. Despite all this, many people are not aware that it's already begun. The Bible warns us that before the Antichrist fully appears, the spirit that supports the Antichrist will be active in the world. 1 John 4.3 puts it this way, But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. Just like when Antiochus was pushing the Jews to worship other gods instead of the one they believed in, today folks are being pushed into following a false religion instead of the real deal. This is sneaky, spreading ideas through the media, schools, and even lifestyles. A few centuries ago, people had no problem talking about their love for Jesus in public. But now, thanks to these anti-Jesus systems, it's rare to find someone brave enough to do that. Instead, people seem more comfortable bragging about their shameful actions. Shameful things that used to be kept in private are now out in the open and accepted by lots of people around the world. Lifestyles such as homosexuality, lesbianism, bisexuality, and promiscuity were done with some level of fear. However, today, this is not the case. Through the spirit of the Antichrist, many of these people have been deceived into believing the lies of the devil. Friends, just like Antiochus made a great effort to see that the worship of God was erased in Jerusalem, this is part of the underground plan for subjection to the Antichrist's reign, disguised as liberalization. People are now advised that they can do anything they like with themselves, even if it destroys them and those they care about. When you try to show them the standard of God's infallible word, they cancel you, flag you as a hater, or call you judgmental. But as long as we live, we must stand our ground and declare God's entire counsel. Dear Believer, this is just one aspect of the underground scheme to usher the world into the government of the Antichrist, otherwise known as the New World Order. A few years before now, nobody thought of the possibility of medical surgeries like the Brazilian butt lift, complete body modifications, and other extreme cosmetic surgeries. Dear friends, all of these are subtle, conscious, and deliberate efforts to ensure the government of the Antichrist will take over soon. Now, dear saints, this is not to say as Christians we should always be withdrawn from technological, medical, or other advancements. However, we must be conscious and pay attention to some of these developments and sensitive to any quiet undertone of evil in them. Just like Antiochus was a big problem for the Jews, nowadays we can see a lot of strong resistance against the gospel and anyone who supports the message of Jesus Christ. Countries, organizations, and systems all over the world are against spreading the message of Jesus. Even the media won't focus on content that talks about salvation through Jesus. Before the Antichrist shows up, there will be even more strong oppositions to the gospel and the kingdom of God. Just like Antiochus, many nations around the world will oppose the gospel. In some countries, it's illegal to openly share your faith. There are institutions worldwide that avoid any connection with Christianity, to be politically correct, and they're often linked to things that go against the message of Jesus Christ, either directly or indirectly. There's something else happening that many are not noticing, a secret plan that could allow the new government to monitor all forms of business and the global economy. Just a few decades ago, we couldn't imagine a world without physical cash. Countries and central banks used to spend a lot of money to print cash, but things have changed a lot. Now we have shifted to a cashless reality in almost every aspect of our daily lives. People can easily make transactions without going to the bank. 
There are over 23,000 digital currencies all around the world. Cryptocurrencies are widely accepted and used as legal tender for buying and selling goods and services in many countries. Commerce is moving more and more towards complete digitalization, which eliminates the monitoring and control problems of the past. Nowadays, some malls and supermarkets use artificial intelligence, cameras, and supercomputers to automatically calculate the items you pick up and process your payment as you leave, without you needing to make any payment yourself. This may seem good and hopeful from a normal human perspective, but as Jesus said, we need to be as gentle as doves and as cunning as serpents. All these could be ways to test some of the tools that may be used during the One World Government. As more and more people use electronic methods to pay for things around the world today, it means that the Antichrist could have complete control over the payments that people make. Let us consider Revelation 13, 16 to 18. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That number is 666. The Antichrist will make everyone take the mark of the beast. The mark is 666. Those who take this mark have chosen the Antichrist and will get all the benefits of his rule. This is like what happened in the old days when some Jews followed the foreign gods that Antiochus brought to them. But those who take the mark of the beast will face eternal punishment and end up in hell. But those who refuse the mark of the beast will face hunger, pain, and death threats. People will try to trick them into taking the mark, but they will be saved if they endure. They will be saved, but they will lose their lives on this earth. Friends, remember that although Antiochus was a very cruel and harsh leader in Jewish history, he's also a sign of the future Antichrist. Daniel's prophecy wasn't only about Antiochus, but also about a future leader who will stop the sacrifices in the temple and put up an idol that will make God angry. Antiochus did something like that, but Jesus said that Daniel's prophecy would come again in the future in Mark 13, 14. Friends, let this be a call to all believers to stay strong and watchful so that we don't fall for the tricks and plans of the devil in these last days. Just like how God's word came true for Antiochus, the Antichrist will also be defeated, but not by human power. His rule will be destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ and his angels, and he will be thrown into hell with all who take the mark of the beast. So today I urge you to stand firm in faith and be wise. Many will be deceived, but we must keep our stand as believers in Christ Jesus. The world is shifting beneath our feet, a giant awakening from its slumber, and it's sending ripples through every aspect of our lives. Yes, something is coming, an event so significant that its echoes will be felt for generations. There is no time for fear but for faith, not for anxiety but for awe. The signs are all around us, like stars in the night sky, guiding us, telling a story written long before our time. These aren't just warnings, they're invitations to witness the majesty and power of a plan greater than us. I invite you to journey with me, to walk through the fog with eyes wide open and hearts ready to receive. We'll explore the scriptures, those ancient words that still echo with relevance and power today. We'll uncover the seven signs, like uncovering precious treasures from the sand, each one a piece of the puzzle, a word in the story of our times. But this isn't just about understanding, it's about transformation. As we delve into these truths, I'll be praying with you for you. We'll seek not just knowledge, but wisdom, not just awareness, but a profound change of heart. This prayer isn't just a closing remark. It's a powerful living connection, a bridge between our hearts and the divine. So, are you ready? Ready to step in this journey with courage and hope? Ready to face the coming change, not as a threat, but as the dawn of something new, something better? Let's not just watch the signs. Let's be part of them. Let's live them. Let's move from spectators to participants in this divine dance of destiny. As we navigate through these tumultuous times, 
the echoes of ancient prophecies ring louder in our ears. Remember the words of Matthew chapter 24, verse 6. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. These words resonate deeply as we witness conflicts and tensions boiling over globally. The scared land of Israel, the prophetic clock for many, is embroiled in conflict, signaling too many the nearing of prophetic times. Consider the world since the shadows of World War II receded. We've edged closer to the abyss again and again, with near misses and close calls with nuclear catastrophe. More nations now hold the keys to this destructive power, and the advent of new, terrifying technologies like hypersonic missiles and drones has transformed warfare. We must ponder deeply. What spark might ignite a global inferno? A third world war that could fulfill the dire warnings of Daniel and other scriptures. Yet, in this climate of fear and uncertainty, we are not left comfortless. The Prince of Peace, our Lord Jesus, offers a peace that surpasses all understanding. It's a peace not dictated by the chaos of this world, but anchored in our unshakable relationship with Christ. Remember King Jehoshaphat, who faced an overwhelming army not with fear, but with faith. His story in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 teaches us that divine victory doesn't always come through battle, but often through steadfast faith and prayer. We are called to the beacons of this peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. We are reminded in Matthew chapter 5 verse 9. Our mission is to sow seeds of reconciliation and understanding in a world torn by strife. We must rise, not as passive observers, but as active peacemakers, embodying the love and peace of Christ. In the face of rumors of wars and the shadows of conflict, let us hold fast to our faith. Let us not be swayed by fear, but be guided by the Holy Spirit to spread peace, understanding, and love. As we stand on the brink of what seems like an inevitable escalation, let our voices join in a chorus of prayer and our actions reflect the love of the one who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Consider the profound words found in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. It's a wake-up call, urging us to discern the real from the deceitful, the light from the darkness. It's easy to lose sight, to blur the lines between right and wrong in a world that often celebrates the contrary. But here's the truth. Embracing or even tolerating what's wrong under the guise of progress or freedom can lead us down a perilous path. It's not just about personal consequences. It's about the collective impact of our communities, our nations, our world. Let's talk about stumbling blocks. Jesus, in Luke chapter 17, verse 12, didn't mince words about the grave consequences of leading others astray. It's a dire warning not just for those who deliberately deceive, but for anyone who, through action or inaction, becomes a conduit for corruption. Every choice you make, every stand you take, sends ripples through the fabric of society. Are you building bridges or barriers to truth? And then there's the intimate struggle, the battle within. Sexual immorality, as highlighted in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, isn't just another sin, it's an invasion, a desecration of the sacred temple that is your body. It's not about casting judgment or spreading shame. It's about understanding the profound significance of purity, of respecting yourself and the divine spirit that dwells within. But the warnings don't stop there. Idolatry, the subtle thief of devotion, can creep into our lives in many forms. Money, power, even the insatiable need for approval. Exodus chapter 20 verse 35 doesn't just speak of graven images. It's a reminder that nothing should eclipse our commitment to what's truly paramount, our relationship with the Creator. So, what's the message for these last days? It's not a prophecy of doom, but a beacon of hope. It's a call to return to what's real, to what matters. It's an invitation to look beyond the surface, to see the world not just as it is, but as it could be. It's about taking a stand, making a difference, and walking a path of integrity and purpose. This is your wake-up call, it's time to shake off complacency to challenge the status quo, to question the narratives fed to you. It's time to seek truth, to foster love, to build bridges of understanding and pathways to peace. The journey won't be easy. It will demand courage, conviction, and an unwavering commitment to what's right. But the rewards, a life of authenticity, a legacy of impact, a world transformed, are beyond measure. So, as you stand at the threshold of eternity, Remember this, you're not just a bystander. You're a participant in the unfolding story of humanity. 
Your actions, your choices, your voice matter. The warnings of the past aren't just ancient texts. They're timeless beacons guiding us toward a brighter, more enlightened future. The ancient wisdom found in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3-5 through 5 isn't just text on a page. It's a living, breathing warning. It tells us of a time, perhaps a time much like our own, where folks will turn their ears away from the truth, seeking comfort in fables rather than facing the sometimes harsh light of reality. It's not just about the information we casually scroll past on our screens. It's about what we let nestle into our hearts. Are we building fortresses around our spirits, or are we leaving the gates wide open for any passing thought or whim? Luke 17 doesn't just speak of ancient times. It's a mirror reflecting our own lives. Just as people in the days of Noah were caught off guard, so too might we be if we're not careful. This isn't about predicting dates or times. It's about a state of readiness, a way of living that keeps us tethered to what truly matters. Think about it. How often do we really listen? I mean truly listen to the world around us, to each other, to that quiet, persistent voice of the divine whispering through the chaos. It's not just about the words we hear. It's about the truths we choose to accept and the lies we decide to reject. But let's not get lost in gloom. This is also a message of hope, a reminder that amidst the noise and haste, there's a path of peace, a way of living that aligns with a deeper, more enduring truth. It's about turning back to the basics, to a gospel that doesn't just comfort but also challenges, that calls us not just to believe but to act with courage and conviction. Imagine, just for a moment, standing firm in a world that's constantly shifting. Picture yourself not as a leaf tossed by the wind but as a tree, rooted, strong, and unshakable. That's the kind of resilience and steadfastness we're talking about here. It's not about bracing for impact. It's about living with such purpose and clarity that whatever comes our way, we're ready. Not just to endure, but to thrive. So, as we look ahead to eternity, let's not do so with dread or anxiety. Let's view it as a chance to deepen our understanding, to strengthen our resolve, and to live with such authenticity and passion that we can't help but make a difference. It's about waking up each day with the intention to live fully, love boldly, and tread lightly on this earth that's been entrusted to us. Jesus Christ, our Savior, is coming back. Each day we walk a path riddled with temptations and distractions, lured away by the fleeting pleasures of this world. Yet in the midst of this chaos, there's a voice that whispers, a gentle yet firm reminder that we're meant for more than this temporary existence. This world, with all its glitter and glamour, is just a shadow compared to the brilliant reality awaiting us. Now, imagine a moment in time, a moment that's hurtling towards us with the inevitability of tomorrow's sunrise. In this moment, the mundane gives way to the miraculous. We who have kept the faith, who have dared to believe amidst scoffers and doubters, will witness the ultimate vindication of our belief. Jesus will return, not as a humble carpenter, but as the King of Kings, ready to gather those who have eagerly awaited His return. But here's the catch. We don't know the hour. It could be as we draw our next breath or years down the line. This uncertainty isn't a cause for fear, but a call to readiness. It's a call to live each day with purpose, integrity, and anticipation. It's a call to look beyond the immediate and see the eternal. You might be wondering, how do I prepare for such an event? It's simpler and yet more profound than you might think. It starts with a choice. A decision not to just believe in Jesus, but to follow Him, to let His teaching shape your life and His love guide your actions. It's about turning away from the patterns of this world and transforming your mind through the power of God's Word. But it's more than just personal transformation. It's about being a beacon of hope and truth in a world that's often dark and confusing. It's about showing others the way, not through force or judgment, but through love, compassion, and a life that reflects the light of Christ. Let's make a conscious decision to be ready. Let's commit to a deeper relationship with Christ, to a life that's alert and oriented towards His coming. Let's engage in conversations that matter, share the hope that sustains us, and love in a way that reflects the heart of our coming King. This isn't about fear or doom. It's about joy, anticipation, and the ultimate reunion with our Savior. It's about living a life that's rich in meaning and purpose, knowing that our time here is just the beginning. So, let's embrace this journey with open hearts and minds. Let's encourage one another, build each other up, and spread the word that something incredible is coming. Get ready. 
Stay alert and keep your eyes on the horizon. The best is yet to come. And if this message has touched your heart, then leave a like and subscribe to this channel. Do you know that some people will be left behind after the rapture? What will happen to them? Who are these people? Why will they be left behind? But before we go any further, let's first understand what the rapture is. The rapture is an event in the future where God takes all believers from earth. This sets the stage for God's judgment during a time called the tribulation. God will bring all believers who've died back to life, give them new perfect bodies, and then take them from earth. The living believers will also receive new perfect bodies and will be taken at that time. The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-17 that, For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. It's really important to mention that the word rapture isn't found in the Bible. The term comes from a Latin word meaning a carrying off, a transport, or a snatching away. The idea of the rapture is clearly taught in the Bible and is supported by many scriptures. This topic is very sensitive, but also crucial because we must consider how ready we are for the rapture. It also helps us to align ourselves and examine our hearts based on God's eternal word to see where we need to make changes. As we go through this discussion, our main scripture will be from John 3.18, which says, Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. The Bible tells us that those who believe in Jesus Christ are not condemned, but it's a different story for unbelievers. They're turning away from God's only solution for their sins. By rejecting God's greatest gift and not believing, they're adding to their sins and calling God a liar. Unless these people change their ways and believe in the gospel, they'll face condemnation. This is a call for everyone to accept Jesus Christ as the perfect sacrifice for sin and avoid the condemnation that awaits those who turn down this offer of salvation. Now, let's look at a few groups of people who will be left behind after the rapture. The first group is the undecided. Some people are closed off to the message of salvation no matter how much they hear about it. They won't make a decision to follow Jesus even if they hear powerful sermons or messages. What's interesting about this group is that they keep delaying their decision for the Lord, as if they control their own lives. They know deep down that Jesus is the only way to God, yet they won't accept His sacrifice by making Him their Lord and Savior. This group includes many churchgoers, people who were born and baptized in the church, and even the children of pastors and other church leaders. They know the gospel, but deny its power to save them from their sins. It's interesting to note that the people in this group never make a meaningful decision to follow the Lord in their lifetime. Some mistakenly believe the rapture's already happened, while others think it's just a religious fantasy meant to keep people in fear. They're the ones the scripture warns us about, who say things like, our ancestors told us about the rapture, but it hasn't happened yet. It's been ages. The Bible calls them scoffers, they ask when the Lord will return, forgetting that He is patient, hoping for everyone to repent and not perish. Their indecision will lead to them being left behind. Think about the story of the ten virgins in Matthew 25, 1-13. They're like the five foolish virgins who had lamps but no oil to light them. When the bridegroom arrived at midnight, they had no oil. While they went to get more oil, the bridegroom came and took the five wise virgins. Procrastination is very dangerous when it comes to making decisions about your eternity. Many people will be left behind on account of procrastination and indecision. Some young folks believe that they'll enjoy their 20s, 30s, and 40s, and then they'll decide when they get to their 60s. But this isn't wise, because your life is not in your hands. This is one of the devil's tricks to deceive people into eternal damnation. I want you to know, people die every day, both good and bad, sick and healthy, young and old, rich and poor. 
no one's promise the next day. If you already know and are convinced in your heart that Jesus came to this world and died for the sins of the world, there's truly no point in being undecided about your decision to follow Jesus. You can make the decision today and be on the path to eternal bliss. Or you can keep procrastinating, which is extremely dangerous because you cannot know when the trumpet will sound. The second group is the holier than thou. This is also known as the self-righteous group of people. What does it mean to be holier than thou? It means being so convinced of our human perfection rather than embracing Jesus' perfection that's freely given to us by faith. It is painfully true that those who believe in their self-righteousness will be left behind after the rapture. This category of people rely on their holier-than-thou attitude, behavior, and sacraments more than they believe in Christ's finished work on the cross at Calvary. One thing that's very common with people in this category is that they rely on human effort rather than divine grace. They don't see salvation from the standpoint of grace. They see it by works. Their attitude is closely related to the Pharisees in Jesus' days. Throughout the New Testament, Jesus pointed out their holier-than-thou attitude, which made them look good, but deep within, they were weighed down by the sin of self-righteousness. They stood on the ground of things like how long they prayed, how often they fasted, how much they gave, how regularly they attended worship, and how frequently they attended to the poor and needy in society. While all these acts are great for every child of God, it's more important that we know that nobody can rely on these things to be saved. Isaiah 64, 6 says, All of us have become like the one who's unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. Self-righteousness is a deadly mirage that deceives many folks into the belief that they can be saved through their own merit. These individuals reject God's saving grace in Christ Jesus, which leads them to being left behind on the day of rapture. Ephesians 2, 8-9 reconfirms to us that, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Self-righteousness creates a heart that is usually far from God and filled with pride, judgment, and a very critical spirit that disconnects them from the real blessings of God's grace. No holier-than-thou person will be raptured because of their trust in their own merit instead of Christ's finished work. Rather than holding on to this very thing that disqualifies you, why not embrace God's grace through faith in Christ Jesus and forsake arrogance? God's grace is wonderful in that there's nothing you do that qualified you for it. This is why so many will not be raptured. It sounds too simple to be true. And this leads us to the last group I want to share with you. The third group is unbelievers. In contrast to popular opinion, the sin that takes people to hell is the sin of unbelief. Unbelief is what I consider to be the greatest evil on earth. Who is an unbeliever? An unbeliever is anyone who refuses to place their faith in Jesus Christ. This group is destined to be left behind after the glorious rapture. People who don't believe are already condemned according to John 3.18. These are people who remain resolute about the rejection of God's offer of salvation. They erroneously reject Christ's divinity as false. They've come to a willful conclusion about their stance on Jesus' sacrifice. This willful denial is what keeps their name out of the book of life. By this denial, they have closed the doorway of God's mercy upon themselves and are now marked for eternal condemnation. This is why they'll be left behind after the rapture. It's impossible to willfully reject God's gift of salvation without the damning consequences of eternal hell. This is one truth many people don't want to admit today. There's practically nothing that can be done to anyone who dies without believing in Jesus. In fact, there's nothing like purgatory. Purgatory is a deception. It's not biblical and remains a religious fantasy. Praying for the dead is as good as fetching water with a basket. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.10 about the importance of being reconciled with God. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. 
those who don't believe will have to deal with the terrible result of rejecting the Savior. Even though God loves everyone, His love won't let everyone be taken up in the rapture because they've already had the chance to accept His best offer. The rapture is only for those who have been cleansed by Jesus' precious blood. Missing the rapture isn't the main issue. The real problem is living through the suffering and pain of the Great Tribulation. It's also the agony of knowing that salvation is free and simple, yet you ignored it. Those who are left behind will have a lot to deal with, and there's no middle ground with the rapture. You're either taken up or left behind. There is no negotiating this. This should also motivate us as believers to share the gospel like never before. God's love is reaching out to all of us now while there's still time. When the Lord's trumpet sounds, the question that will remain for each of us is, will you be taken up or left behind? You've seen the headlines and felt the unease in the air, the kind that lingers like a shadow, hinting at something more. It's as if the world is holding its breath, waiting for a revelation, a divine sign amidst the chaos. What if the answers we're seeking, the ones about our future and fate, are closer than we think? Who's your role model? Are you following the crowd? Would God call you and say, come with me, my child? Or would he tell you, turn away from me? We see a lot of enticing things, things that appear to be God, but in fact, they're rotting. And the worst part about them is that they don't stop at themselves. They'll drag you with them and you'll be left when they are. But if you don't want this to be you, then watch this video to learn about the signs every believer should look for before Christ returns. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. Matthew 24, 43 to 44. Consider the wise homeowner, vigilant and watchful, who ensures his house isn't plundered by the thieves in the night. We too must be alert, for the coming of the Lord is like that unexpected thief, arriving at an hour we can't predict. And it's not about just being watchful. It's about understanding the times and seasons. We're not meant to be caught off guard, for the signs are there, woven into the fabric of our world, in the whispers of creation, and in the unfolding events in the Holy Land. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly, as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1-4 The day of the Lord approaches like a thief in the night, but for those attuned to the Spirit, this isn't a cause for fear, but a call to readiness. Look around. Consider the world events, the rumblings in the Holy Land. These aren't random occurrences, but the unfolding of a divine blueprint, prophecies uttered by ancient voices now echoing through our time. We're living in a historic hour, a period foretold with precision and passion by the prophets. How do we consider the state of our hearts and our readiness for such a time? The Bible isn't a dusty book of old tales. It's alive, breathing life into our daily walk with God. Within its pages, we find clues and markers that guide us, like a roadmap to treasure beyond our imagination. Take, for instance, the restoration of Israel, a prophecy fulfilled right before our eyes. On a day marked in history, Israel rose from the ashes of time, a nation reborn. This isn't just a political event, it's a spiritual signpost, a clear indicator that God's Word is alive and active. The Hebrew language, once scattered across the winds of diaspora, has returned to its homeland, echoing the ancient promises of Scripture. Yet amid these monumental events, it's crucial to remember the personal call to each believer. This isn't a passive wait, it's an active preparation, a life lived in the conscious awareness of Christ's imminent return. It's about being alert, prayerful, and discerning, 
not swayed by the false doctrines or the allure of a complacent life. So, let's talk heart to heart here. Are you living in the light of eternity? Are your days marked by a pursuit of holiness, a desire to be found ready and waiting? The signs are all around us, reminding us that this world is just a prelude to something far greater. Let's not get lost in the noise and chaos of everyday life. Instead, let's lift our eyes, tune our hearts, and align our lives with the profound truth of Christ's return. Now, let's shift our gaze to the landscape of prophecy, where nations aren't just geopolitical entities, but chess pieces in a divine game. Take Russia, an enigma wrapped in a mystery, often mentioned in whispers of end-time prophecy. It's not just a country, it's a symbol, a sign, a piece of the puzzle. Ancient names like Gog, Magog, Meshach, and Tubal aren't just historical footnotes, they're alive whispering secrets of what's to come. They speak of a nation reborn, a bear awakened, with eyes set on a land flowing with milk and honey. These signs, these events, aren't just for scholars to debate. They're for you and me to ponder, to prepare. The call isn't for fear, but for readiness. An invitation to live in such a way that when the trumpet sounds, when the skies part, we're not caught unaware, but are found waiting expectant like servants who know their master will return. We're not talking doom and gloom. We're talking about a future so bright it outshines the sun. A future where tears are memories and pain is an old enemy long defeated. So let's watch, let's live, let's love with our eyes on the skies and our feet firmly doing good on the earth. Let's be the ones who not only read the signs but become signs ourselves living testimonies that the best is yet to come. Our language isn't fear, but hope. Not despair, but joy. Our words are simple. Our hearts are open. And our spirits are attuned to the whispers of the divine. We are not waiting for the world to end. We're waiting for a new one to begin. A world where peace isn't just a dream, but a reality. Where love isn't just a concept, but the air we breathe. Imagine standing at the edge of a great chasm, the wind whispering tales of ancient times, times of Sodom and Gomorrah, where chaos ruled and love was lost. We are told of times to come that mirror those days, a cascade of hearts turning cold, a parade of egos, and a celebration of all that's wrong. Yet this isn't just a story to scare, but to prepare. It's a call to awaken, to see beyond the facade and recognize the world's shifting sands. Picture a world where love becomes a rare currency, where truth is a commodity few can afford. People, obsessed with their reflection, lost in a labyrinth of self-admiration, speak words of poison, breaking bonds like twigs underfoot. Ungrateful hearts and unholy thoughts weave a tapestry of tomorrow's history, a history we're living today. And in this dizzy dance of disorder, even those clad in the cloak of faith may stumble, their steps unsure. But wait, listen closely to the whispers of the ages, the verses penned with divine ink. They speak not just of downfall, but of hope, a promise of return, a reunion with the Creator. Yet scoffers mock this promise, their laughter echoing through the corridors of time their eyes blind to the unfolding prophecy. They ask, where is this coming he promised? But like a symphony reaching its crescendo, the signs grow louder, clearer, and more urgent. For even in this chaos, there's a pattern, a divine script unfolding, and within it, a role for each of us. We're not mere spectators, but participants in a cosmic play where our choices our faith and our love matter immensely. This isn't just about watching for signs, but about understanding them, about seeing the world through a lens polished with wisdom and hope. It's about discerning the real from the counterfeit, the light from the dazzling distractions. For in these times, even the wicked will wear masks of righteousness, their true nature hidden beneath a veneer of virtue. So, what are these signs, you ask? Well, they're the echoes of ancient words in today's headlines. The love that grows cold in a neighbor's heart. 
the truth twisted into convenient lies, and the rising tide of chaos disguised as freedom. They're the subtle shifts in what's deemed right and wrong, the blurring lines that once were clear. But amid this, remember, this isn't just a tale of despair, but of preparation and hope. It's a reminder to live with eyes wide open, hearts tuned to the divine frequency, and spirits anchored in unshakable faith. It's a call to stand firm, to love fiercely in the face of hatred, and to embody the very essence of the divine love we await. As we journey through this world, let's be beacons of hope, love, and truth. Let's be the ones who, when the world spins into chaos, remain steadfast, eyes fixed on the horizon, hearts ready for the coming dawn. For in the end, it's not just about surviving the storm, but about who we become in the midst of it. And when the signs unfold, as they surely will, let's not be found wanting. Instead, let's be ready, with open arms and unwavering faith, to welcome the return of the one true light, the beacon in the storm, the architect of our salvation. This is our story, our journey, and our calling. Let's embrace it with courage, love, in a hint of divine anticipation. Consider the revival not just an ancient tale from Acts 3, but as a present reality unfolding before our very eyes. This isn't a faint hope, but a roaring fire, a spiritual awakening where souls are ignited with a passion for the divine. It's a revival where the dimmest of lights become blazing torches, where the ordinary becomes extraordinary through the touch of the Holy Spirit. Envision the world cloaked in shadows, not as a sign of defeat, but as the ultimate backdrop for the brilliance of divine glory to shine the brightest. It's in these contrasting moments that the true magnificence of grace is most visible. Where there's darkness, the light doesn't just pierce through, it shatters the night with overwhelming splendor. And now, consider the return of the King of Glory, the Eastern Gate sealed for centuries, stands not as a barrier, but as a promise. A promise that no human effort, no earthly plan can hinder. It's a testament to the unstoppable force of divine prophecy, a foretelling of the moment when all creation will witness the ultimate victory. In this narrative, there's no room for passive waiting or idle speculation. We're called to action, to live in such a way that our very lives become a testament to the coming glory. We're urged to rise, shine, and reflect the divine presence in every word, deed, and thought. It's a call to live not just in the expectation of what's to come, but in the manifestation of what's already here, the kingdom of God within us.